Hello and welcome to our next video for U.S. History 2. Uh, this one's on the Great Depression and the New Deal. Uh, congratulations also on surviving your midterm exam. Most of you did well, so um, let's hope we continue with that for this semester. All right, first thing is going to be the Great Depression. And really to understand the Great Depression, we're going to start back in 1921. That way you can kind of understand the lead up to it. So 1921, this guy from Ohio named Warren G. Harding, he's a quiet conservative man, is going to run for president and he's going to win. Um, Harding kind of has a questionable side to him. He's known to drink too much. He's known to tell fibs and stories. He plays a little bit too much poker. And he also has an extramarital affair. He has a long-term mistress who he actually fathers a child with. And he surrounds himself with some questionable people. Like his veterans bureau chief is caught stealing money from the veteran affairs department or part of the government. His attorney general bribes people to look the other way and, and steals money from the government. And his interior secretary, a guy named Albert Fall, actually leases government oil reserves and leases government land to oil men in exchange for about $400,000 in bribes. And that's the real big one, stealing money getting $400,000 in bribes and selling off government land that shouldn't have been sold. So Warren G. Harding makes people a little nervous. And then in 1923, Warren G. Harding is going to die from a heart attack. And his vice president, a guy named Calvin Coolidge, is going to replace him. Now, I mentioned Calvin Coolidge in my video about how the farmers were being treated. And under Calvin Coolidge, if you remember, uh, the Farm Act didn't get passed or anything like that. So if you can't tell, Calvin Coolidge was extremely pro-business, and really Warren G. Harding was too. Between Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge, they tried to undo pretty much everything that was done during the Progressive Era. Uh, they also are going to appoint five Supreme Court justices between the two of them, including former President William Howard Taft, who becomes the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Now, Calvin Coolidge specifically, he raises tariff rates to an all-time high. He pushes these big tax breaks, especially for businesses and upper-class incomes. Government does not help farmers. Government does not help flood victims in the Mississippi River Delta. And foreign policy, completely isolationist. They the United States does not join the League of Nations. The United States does not participate in international affairs at all. Well, in 1928, this Republican-run government continues. And in 1928, Herbert Hoover is going to beat Al Smith for the presidency. Now, yes, this is the same Herbert Hoover who ran the Food Administration in World War I. Because Hoover helped in World War I, he was seen as very progressive. And there were some Republicans who didn't like him because of that. But he still was able to win the presidency. Now, if I was to give Hoover one term... Uh, he believed in this idea of volunteerism. He encouraged voluntary self-regulation of business. Now, what that means is he wanted businesses to voluntarily raise wages, voluntarily plan their production, voluntarily standardize products. And he thought that this voluntary self-regulation by businesses was the best way to go because a business in the eyes of Herbert Hoover is going to do what's best for everybody because that's how businesses would succeed. Now, in reality, you can kind of see that's that's probably a little bit too idealistic. And it didn't really work out for Herbert Hoover as much as he had hoped. 
Now, the big thing is the stock market crash, and this is going to happen in 1928. Um, by 1928, more than 9 million people in America are investing in stocks. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but for the time period, it was. Uh, today, we're going through the game stock craze and, and Robin Hood and all that. Well, this has happened before. But what was different is in 1928, you were allowed to buy on the margin. Basically, what would happen is you would pay 10% of the stock's value, you would get the stock, and then you would pay off the rest of it when the stock price went up. So let's say um, at last check, I think game stock was at about $230. Let's just say that you bought it today for $230, you would only have to pay 10% of that, $23 and then it would have to go up even more for you to pay off the other $200 that you owed. In likelihood, GameStop won't reach $450 or $500, although it'd be nice if it did. What will probably happen though is GameStop will either stay the same or start to go back down. Well, what happens if you still owe $200 on a stock that you, you need to pay that off? Well, if you don't have the money to pay that off, you're going to start selling everything you own or you're going to start having to borrow money from other people. And it gets you in a really big pos position, it gets you in trouble. Well, because it was so easy to buy on the margin, people were just buying stocks with money they didn't have. On top of that, the taxes were low for the rich. The Federal Reserve was giving credit to just about everybody who asked for it. So on paper, it looked like everybody was doing well, but when you actually looked at the ledgers and the bank accounts, you could see some questionable activity. Well, in early 1828, the sale of automobiles starts to slow down and the, the uh, start of new production slows down and construction projects start to slow down as well. The Federal Reserve realizes this is happening and they warn banks, hey, stop lending so much money, but the banks ignore it and the banks just keep handing out money like it was water. When we get to October, specifically October 24th of 1929, the stock market start to go down. It's the first time they have gone down in quite a while. In fact, on that one day that is now known as Black Thursday, stock prices went down about 11%. When the stock market opened on Monday the 28th, stocks went down another 12%. By the time we get to Tuesday, October 29th, the bottom falls out of the market. Stock market just plummets off a cliff. People could not get rid of their stocks because nobody was buying anything. This free fall is going to continue until November 13th. We've got more than two weeks of just plummeting prices. By the time it's all over, the stock market has lost about 70% of its value. In other words, that dollar in your pocket is now worth 30 cents. To give this an actual number, on October 23rd of 1929, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was around 350. It fluctuated a little bit depending on what time of the day. By 1932, it has fallen down to about 40 points. It's a huge, huge sell-off. Now, what's the cause of this? Why suddenly out of nowhere did the stocks fall and crash? Well, there's four real reasons I'm gonna give you. Reason number one, maldistribution of wealth. Channeling my inner Bernie Sanders, if you will, 
40% of Americans earned about 10 to 15% of all of the income. So the top of the American food chain was very, very wealthy. Everybody else, not so much. Then you've got overproduction. Companies just continue to buy luxury goods, or I should say companies continue to sell luxury goods, whether consumers could afford it or not. There's also the problem of market saturation. In reality, there are only so many cars somebody needed. There's only so many refrigerators somebody needed. And usually supply and demand say if there's no demand for a product, that product's not made anymore. That didn't happen in the late 1920s. So you end up with warehouses full of goods waiting to be sold. You have the agricultural decline. The 1920s were not good for farming and it just continued to get worse and worse and worse. And then you have to also look at Europe. By the time we get to the mid 1920s, Germany tries to make its first payment towards the cost of World War I. Their economy collapses almost overnight. And when their economy collapses, so does the rest of the European economy. All right, well, that's all good and, and nice, but what does this actually mean? How can I put this in a way that makes sense to you? Well, from 1929, to 1932, the gross national product of the United States, meaning the value of everything the United States makes, goes down by about 50%. In other words, in three years, the United States loses half of its value. The United States is worth half as much as it was previously. Somewhere around 5,500 banks fail. Now, it's not like today where if your bank closes, somebody else comes in and reopens your bank. No, if your bank was one that closed, your money was gone forever. So that means people who had their accounts with 5,000 plus banks, just their life savings disappeared overnight. Farm prices, the value of agricultural land goes in a free fall. And the unemployment rate goes from about 3% to 25%. One out of every four Americans is out of work. And if you were a minority, it's more like three out of four. Uh, there was a saying, a phrase during the Great Depression that said that African Americans were the last hired and the first fired. There's a rise in alcoholism. There's a rise in pregnancy rates. There's a drop in education rates. There's no college attendance because people can't afford to go to school. And if that's not enough, the little cherry on top of this bowl of misery is the dust bowl. There is this major drought that begins in 1930. And it was all because of poor soil conservation, and it was all because of over farming the land in the Midwest and in the Great Plains. When the rain stopped coming, the topsoil dries up, and the winds start to carry it away. There are these huge clouds of dust that whip up in the 1930s. And dust goes all over Oklahoma, all over Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa. And you can see here some pictures of what these Dust Bowl storms actually looked like. There's dust everywhere. Everything is covered in dust. People are breathing in dust. People actually cough up dirt balls almost like it's a cartoon. Because of the Dust Bowl, because there's no water, there's no crops, 
livestock starts to die. There's a lack of food. And people start to die from something called dust pneumonia. So it's like, you know, a little misery added on top of misery. Now, Herbert Hoover and the government, what do they try to do? Well, not a whole lot. Uh, Herbert Hoover tries to get everybody to stay optimistic. He asks people to, to keep their faith. And he asks people to believe in his idea of volunteerism. So he goes to businesses and asks them to keep paying people. He goes to businesses and asks them to keep people employed voluntarily. Well, let's think about this. If you're a company, you're not making money, you have to cut people. So that's unrealistic. Herbert Hoover is going to ask states and local governments to help those who are unemployed. This is a time before unemployment insurance exists and states can't afford it. So volunteerism is going to fail and it's going to fail spectacularly. And Herbert Hoover is so checked out of reality. If you can't tell, I don't really like Herbert Hoover very much. But Herbert Hoover is so checked out from reality that he actually proposes a tax increase so he can balance the budget. Now, never mind that, you know, one out of every four Americans is unemployed and they can't pay taxes. Herbert Hoover says, what the heck? Let's raise taxes anyways. Now, there is one positive that comes out of Herbert Hoover's administration as president. And that's that in 1932, Congress in created something called the Reconstruction Finance Company. And the Reconstruction Finance Company, or the RFC, is going to provide up to $2 billion to banks, railroads, and insurance companies to keep them in business. It's not until July of 1932 that Herbert Hoover eventually let some of this money be used to go towards unemployment. While that's going on, in June of 1932, there's about 10,000 World War I veterans who marched on Washington asking for their promised bonus to be paid. The way it worked is if you served in World War I, Congress promised the soldiers a payable bonus so many years. I think it was 25 years after the war ended. Well, here we are in 1930, 1931, 1932. Those veterans are going broke, can't afford to put food on their table. And so they march in Washington and they want Congress to pay them what they're owed. The army is called out. And the head of the army, Douglas MacArthur, is going to use the army to disperse these 10,000 war veterans. These 10,000 war veterans see that the military is marching through Washington, DC. They think that the military is putting on a parade to thank them for their service. But in reality, General Douglas MacArthur is going to order tear gas, bayonets, and tanks to break up these World War I veterans. Ultimately, because of Herbert's failure through volunteerism, his callousness to try and balance the budget, and the way the veterans are treated, Herbert Hoover is not very well liked when it comes to the election of 1932. And that brings us to the New Deal. FDR is going to win the 1932 election. He's going to be elected president on March 4th, 1933. If you want an idea how big this, this um, election was, FDR wins 57% of the popular vote. About 23 million votes to 16 million votes. FDR wins 42 out of 48 states. And he gets 472 electoral votes to Herbert Hoover's 59. So there's no question who the winner of this is. 
So immediately upon FDR being inaugurated as president on March 4th, 1933, he starts this drastic program of legislation trying to help the country overcome the Great Depression. His very, very first step is a four-day bank holiday. He gets Congress to pass something called the Emergency Banking Relief Act. During this four-day holiday, Roosevelt gives his first fireside chat where he speaks to the country on radio. He tells them that if your bank reopens, then your bank is safe. Put your money back in the bank. As a part of this Emergency Banking Relief Act, in June of 1933, the FDIC is created, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And that's what guarantees your bank deposits today if your bank closes. FDR is going to abandon the gold standard, which means that the value of money can be manipulated, which means more money can be put into circulation. And Congress passes the 21st Amendment, which ends prohibition. Now, the first 100 days of FDR's presidency is often called the alphabet soup. And that's because there are so many different parts of the government that are breathed to life during this time. <clears throat> For example, we have the CCC the Civilian Conservation Corps. It's created in March of 1933, and its job is to put young men between the ages of 18 and 25 to work. There are somewhere around 3 million men who are put to work in national forests, national parks, recreation areas. They do soil conservation projects, and they only get paid $30 a month, but that's much, much more than what most people were getting during the day. On top of that, the CCC was run by the army, by army officers. And so the CCC camps were the semi-military atmospheres where the workers receive drill, they're disciplined, and they live basically in a barracks and in a camp. Now, if you are in or around Carrollton or Villa Rica, there was actually a CCC camp, a Civilian Conservation Corps camp, just a little bit south of where the Walmart is next to Interstate 20. Next, we have FERA, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, and it was led by Harry L. Hopkins, who's going to end up becoming the second most powerful person in FDR's administration. When the FERA or FERA was created in May of 1933. Harry Hopkins spends $5 million on projects in his first two hours on the job. That's right, he spent $5 million in the first two hours of his employment. Now, FERA was aimed at uh, working through states and providing construction projects that put people to work. Over $500 million in FIRA money went to building public buildings, bridges, adult literacy programs, college education programs, and even daycares. Next, we have the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. That was authorized by FDR to provide power to some of the poorest places in America. Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Kentucky. We also have the AAA, May 1933, the Agriculture Adjustment Act. Uh, this one was controversial. And what happened is the government would pay farmers to plow their crops under or slaughter their livestock and send, instead of sending them to market. Now, the reason this is controversial is because you have hundreds, if not thousands of people who were hungry or starving and you are killing the cows, the sheep, the pig, uh, the plowing down the corn. 
But the whole idea behind it was if you reduce the production, if you reduce the amount of goods in the market, then the prices will begin to rise. So once again, you can see where that would be a little bit controversial, but it was done. There's still more alphabet soup. I told you there's a lot here. You have NIRA, N-I-R-A, the National Industrial Recovery Act. This is June of 1933. Now, the whole idea between NIRA was to get businesses to work together with the government to play along with what the government wanted. And if you did that, if, if you were a business owner and you worked with the government, the government granted you immunity from antitrust lawsuits. Now, as part of the National Industrial Recovery Act, we have the creation of the National Recovery Administration, or the NRA. Now, what the NRA was supposed to do <clears throat> was to set production limits so businesses could only make so many products or so many units of one product. It was going to put limits on how much wages could be cut. It was going to oversee working conditions. And it was going to ban what the government called unfair competitive practices. Basically, one business cannot drive another business out of business. The idea behind this was emphasized or strengthened by the NRA Blue Eagle. And you can see a Blue Eagle stamp right there. Any business who cooperated fully with the National Recovery Administration was allowed to put this Blue Eagle on their products. And the government encouraged people to buy only Blue Eagle products. So if you're a company who is not in compliance with the NRA, you very quickly did get in compliance because you wanted people to buy your products. All right, you also have, as part of the National Industrial Recovery Act, something called the Public Works Administration, or PWA. The PWA <clears throat> authorizes $3.5 billion for public works programs to put uh, the unemployed back to work. This is led by somebody named Harold Ickes. And Harold Ickes and the PWA spend all total a little over $4 billion. And it puts together about 35,000 construction projects. The PWA is going to construct dams, construct bridges, construct post offices. And the very famous Hoover Dam was built as part of the PWA. Now, a little bit outside the first 100 days, we're talking November of 1933, so it's a couple months after the start of FDR's presidency. The CWA, or the Civil Works Administration, is created. And the CWA only exists from November of 1933 until February of 1934. So about four months. And in four months, the CWA spends over $1 billion. Four months, $1 billion. Now, the idea was to find random projects, little short-term projects, that could be done. And through the CWA, over 4 million unemployed workers find a paycheck. Now, if you keep in track, that is a lot of money that was spent in the New Deal. And there were a lot of people against it. Uh, one of the groups against it was called the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. And that's because of the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Now, the reason the Southern Tenant Farmers Union didn't like the AAA is because landowners would stop farming land, but they would stop farming land that was lived on by sharecroppers. 
So instead of, if you're a landowner, you probably have people who are renting part of your land and trying to make a living. And if you're a land owner, you're going to kick those people off the land and you're going to make their land sit still and not be worked while the land that you personally controlled, you're still doing business on it. You also have the American Liberty League. Uh, the American Liberty League accused FDR of being a communist and accused FDR of being a socialist. And they said that the New Deal was a socialist plot to take over America. But then we have two particular names. The first name is Father Charles Coughlin. Father Charles Coughlin, he did a radio program out of Detroit. He was a, he was a Catholic priest with a very large following. And he used the radio to spread his ideas and his beliefs on FDR. Coughlin is going to turn against FDR and he's going to tell his listeners, hey, look, capitalism is dying. We need to build a new system based on social justice, but he doesn't really say what his idea of social justice is. He's going to argue that the nation's problems were caused by bankers and that the banks should be controlled by the national government. And as time goes on, Father Charles Coughlin is going to become more and more anti-Semitic until by mid-1935 or so, uh, he's censured, meaning he's called out and reprimanded for his political activities by the Catholic Church. We also have Huey Long. He is known as the Kingfish. He's a governor of Louisiana, then he becomes a U.S. Senator, and he was probably going to run for president in 1936. In January of 1934, he starts this program called Share Our Wealth. And in the Share Our Wealth program, uh, Huey Long, he proposed some ideas that were very popular. He wanted to have personal fortune limits. Basically, if you had wealth above a certain dollar amount, anything in excess would be given away. And that money that was given away would be used to give every family enough money to buy a house, buy an automobile, buy a radio. Huey Long thought those were the necessities that every family needed. The elderly would be given a pension, meaning the elderly would get money recurring each month. Young men with good grades would be sent to college for free. And Huey Long wanted to establish a minimum wage, a shorter work week, and then to pay the World War I soldiers any bonuses owed. Now, Huey Long was so popular that over 27,000 Share Our Wealth clubs open up. He has more than 8 million followers and people who were behind his ideas. And as I said, he was very likely going to run for president against FDR in 1936. But in 1935, Huey Long was actually assassinated. And the Share Our Wealth clubs or program begins to decline. Now, if that's not enough, FDR also had to go against the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1935, the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and NERA, the National Industrial Recovery Act, were both ruled unconstitutional. They were both thrown out by the Supreme Court. And between the AAA and the NIRA, that made up the majority, actually, of FDR's New Deal. So FDR runs for president again, and in 1936, FDR wins another term as president, and he proposes a second New Deal. Now, the second New Deal was going to be focused on workers instead of businesses. 
And there is a second generation of alphabet soup. You've got the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, and this is headed by Harry Hopkins. Harry Hopkins, on his very first day on the job for the WPA, spends $5 billion. He just walks into work as the head of this new government agency and writes a check for $5 billion. All total, before the WPA is shut down, Harry Hopkins spends $11 billion. Now, what did all this money go for? Well, it was construction projects. Somewhere like 34,000 construction projects put 8 million people to work. But it wasn't just that. The WPA paid people to paint murals, take photographs, record slave narratives. If you remember earlier in the year, you had to read an excerpt from a book called Black Elk Speaks. Black Elk Speaks was written as part of this WPA program. We also have the National Labor Relations Act, better known as the Wagner Act. And it's the NLRA that guarantees you today the right to organize and the right to a union. Beyond that, we have the Resettlement Administration, which gave money to small farmers and sharecroppers to encourage them to buy their own farms and to keep farming and keep up with production. And it also created the REA, the Rural Electrification Administration. It is the REA that brings power to small communities throughout the country, especially the Southeast. Now you may have heard of this, the Social Security Act that guarantees pensions for the elderly, but it does more than that. It also gives survivor benefits for families of deceased workers. It provided for unemployment insurance and it gave dependent mothers and dependent children help if needed as well. And then last but not least, we have the Fair Labor Standards Act, and that is going to establish a minimum wage and a maximum hours in a work week. It also prevents children under the age of 16 from working without specific conditions. Now, if you're curious who this is, this is a musician named Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie was probably the voice of the Dust Bowl, and he was the voice of the Great Depression. If you have never heard a Woody Guthrie song, you should listen to him. And you've actually heard a Woody Guthrie song, you just don't know it. There's a song you may have sang in like elementary school that goes, this is your land, this is my land. That's a Woody Guthrie song. Anyways, I'm going to leave you with that. Um, if you listen to a Woody Guthrie song, uh, just send me a, a email and let me know what you think. And let me know which Woody Guthrie song you listen to. And if you do that, if you send me an email saying, hey, I listened to Woody Guthrie, and you tell me what you think, whether you liked him or not, I'll give you an extra 10 points on your quiz for this week. So... Um, there's your extra credit opportunity. All right, 40 minutes almost is long enough. I don't want to keep you any more. I hope you enjoy this video. Any questions, concerns, comments, just let me know and I'll answer as quick as I can. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.